everybody. Uh, why are we talking about uh, making the smartphone uh, your superpower? I don't think this is something you don't know. I think this is preaching to the choir. Where are people consuming content? They're consuming it on the smartphone. I'd be willing to bet that you're watching this. You have checked your email today. You have checked your text today. You've checked social media today on your smartphone. Who else is? Your customers, your volunteers, your donors, your uh, your prospects, your audience. So let's not belabor the point any further. Let's go ahead and talk about what we'll cover today. So we're going to talk about how social media and email and text move pe uh, people closer to your business, how to harness... Ooh, that animation did not work. How to harness the strengths of each channel and how to create an overall great experience. And of course, we have Q&A to Randy's point. We'll be taking those questions at the end. Let's just kind of talk about the ultimate marketing goal to send the right message to the right people at the right time in the right channels. In my experience, in my 14 years of constant contact, one thing I've seen a lot of people do, especially when they first start out marketing, is they will gravitate towards social media. Why? Because it's perceived as free and social media is an essential part of a small business or nonprofits uh, uh, marketing channels and marketing process, but it shouldn't be the only one. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges around social media, but do know just because people follow you on social media doesn't necessarily mean they see you. So you want to use these tools in conjunction to grow your business and actually they enhance each other. So let's kind of start with some stats. 86% of the world's population owns a smartphone. That's probably not a surprise. Again, our prospects, our donors, our stakeholders are likely accessing your or some content on their smartphone. In 2023, the current number of smartphone users in the world today is 6.92 billion, meaning that 88, 85% of the world's population owns a smartphone. And people are motivated by the three tools we'll talk about. 34% uh, are motivated and influenced to buy or donate. 34% uh, by email, 30% uh, by text messages, and 20 percent by social media. We want to use these tools in conjunction to help our business grow and to actually help grow our contact list as well. You want to use make sure you're using each channel to tell a specific story. You want to uh, leverage the strength of each channel. So when I say channel, in case you're new to marketing, I'm talking about email, text, social. Those are different channels. We want to use a different kind of strategy for each one. There are times you can repurpose content, and I will talk about that today, but that is not going to be the sole way that you grow using these three tools. You don't want to just use the same plays from the same playbook for each channel. You want to use the strengths of each channel to help you grow your business. So let's pivot that, that kind of idea in here as we talk about harnessing those strengths. We suggest, and we use at Constant Contact, the party principle. So what is the party principle? I'd be willing to bet all of you have been to a fantastic party, maybe recently, right? The holidays just passing. So social media, you want to think of as the big party. That's where everybody's there. The very large audience is a great place for you to engage and network and meet new people. But it may not be the ultimate place to solely put all of your marketing eggs in that basket. Email you want to think of as the after party. You found the people to build relationships with you, and now we want to take them to the next step. We want to massage that relationship in order to take people down to the next uh, 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 step that we need, them, need or want them to do. They have said by connecting to you on email marketing, yes, I want to stay connected to you, and we want to treat these people as a little more special. But the most people is SMS text subscribers, people that have connected to you via uh, 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 by offering their phone number so you can text them. These are your VIPs. These are the people you want to treat very special because you are marketing to them in the most personal channel possible. So let's break down these strengths a little bit more. Social media, you want to use social media when you want to get beyond just email and or text. You're looking to increase engagement so you can find a new audience, so you can broaden your audience. And you remember, you're doing it in public, so anybody can see your posts when you're doing it on social media. It's a fantastic place to fill the funnel, to get as many new people paying attention to you as possible. And of course, it's great at engaging people. With email, you want to build that relationship a little bit deeper. You want to reach your audience a little more directly, and you have a more robust message to share, things like imaging and formatting. And of course, email marketing, as I've said through several of the presentations I've done through Alignable, its most significant power is that it's trackable, meaning that you can see who is literally engaging with you and what kind of actions they've taken. That's a little more obscured within social media. And then SMS. 
we want to definitely focus SMS on something that's time sensitive, that offers something very unique, something that can be handled with a very short message. You want to think of ways that you can use these channels together to support an overall campaign. For example, you can start a conversation about a particular topic on social media to stimulate excitement and engagement, then discuss that topic in a little bit more detail with a little bit more formatting, a little bit more rich content in an email, and then you can use text to call attention to something pressing. Maybe the registration is running out for your event, or they need to take a post-event survey, or they need to take some action. You've got limited product on hand or something of that nature. So let's start with social. With social media, obviously, this is where word of mouth is occurring today. It can happen anytime, sometimes through reviews or shares or mentions, recommendations. Uh, there are all ways to connect with people on social media. Now, one strategy you definitely want to employ on social media is making sure you give people the opportunity to interact with you. Now, obviously, they can, but you want to encourage them to do that. So you can do things like asking questions or asking for feedback. Be in social media to engage because you want that engagement. One, you're building a relationship when you're engaging with people, but you also want to use social media engagement as a way to keep people seeing your content. The more they engage with you, the more likely they're going to see your content. We wanna make sure that we're giving you the biggest possible uh, funnel so that you can move people through the buying process, through the donation process, and that starts with being engaging. Obviously, with social media, one question that I often get is, well, what if people say something or do something negative on my social media channel? You want to make sure you engage there, too. Don't ignore it, or else it will foster. Now, one thing, oh, got to manage my slides more carefully. So let's talk about the variety of different channels available to you. I'd be willing to bet most of you know this, but let's zero in on the strengths of each individual social media channel. So Facebook, it's the big one, right? It's going to be a fantastic place for you to get the biggest audience possible, but do know you're competing with a lot of other information coming at people, especially around friends, family, the news. We want to make sure we're aware that while we pretty much have to be on Facebook, you are competing with a lot of other noise there. LinkedIn is a great place, obviously, for you to have a very personal but business-related call to action. This is going to be a professional network. Now, not all of you will need to be on LinkedIn. It depends on the kind of business you are. Typically, LinkedIn is going to lean more towards the business-to-business, -business, and a lot of nonprofits also engage on LinkedIn. It's not, and I think this is a good point to stress this, don't try to be everywhere. It's almost impossible for you to do that. Now, Constant Contact does have some tools and ways for you to be in more places with just a few steps. But you want to make sure you're focusing on the social media channel that is going to be most effective to you. And the last thing you want to do is start something on social and then you're too busy and you just abandon it. Because what you don't want people to do is just discover you on social media and your last post was in November. Your last post was in June. That does not show that you're a very serious enterprise or organization. We want to make sure that you're leveraging the power of social media by being there regularly. Instagram is a fantastic place to have visual and now video content. Let's you uh, let people see what's going on with your business. Now, to leverage Instagram to the, the, the fullest extent possible, you want to make sure that your, uh, your content is going to be more personalized. So showing behind the scenes, showing customers actually using whatever it is you sell or do, uh, uh, donors, volunteering, et cetera, et cetera. You want to show the life of your business through Instagram. It's very engaging. Twitter, now called X. Uh, is a public news feed, but it is moving very, very quickly. Fantastic place for you to share content that is very timely, but it moves very fast. And so most organizations don't leverage X uh, um, outside of, of fast moving news, right? So if you're an organization that can keep up with the speed of X, then it might make sense for you to pay attention to. And you'll notice that I don't have uh, threads on here, which is the new X slash Twitter competitor on Instagram. As we start to gather more data on the kind of profiles that that is attracting, we'll start to share that. And TikTok is missing from here as well for a similar reason. So Pinterest, a great place for you to share tips and ideas. If you have a very creative uh, uh, business, if there's something that people can leverage in terms of your organization that shows creativity or is very image-based, Pinterest is still a fantastic place for you to do that. YouTube is obviously all about video. It's a fantastic channel for you to share education, entertainment. You just need to make sure that you keep your content 
relatively short. Now, this is going to be dependent on the kind of business you are, but you also want to be mindful. People watch YouTube for entertainment. Now, they can be educated, but you want to make sure that it is not droll and dry content on YouTube. And lastly, organizations like Alignable, a fantastic place for you to do small business networking with a local community feel. No matter which channel you use, your goal should be to get people to your website, get people to your blog, get people to your other social channels, Build your email list. I'm going to underline that with my voice. Social is a fantastic place for you to solicit for people to join your list. I'm going to give you some strategies on how you can get people to join your list. But you want to make sure that social is a place that you look for people to join your list. Again, utilizing social media as the big party where we meet the maximum number of people. We're trying to guide them to that after party by them raising their hand saying, yes, I want a little bit more information. You are starting them on the buyer's journey. You are starting them on the volunteer journey. You are starting them on the donor path. We're moving people uh, closer and closer and closer to our organizations in order to get them to do what we need them to do for the health of our organization. Now, as I said, you can repurpose content, content like your email content, which Constant Contact makes it very easy for you to repurpose content for both social and SMS. You can repackage blog content. You can share user-generated content. Just make sure you get permission for that. What you want to avoid doing on social media is posting literally the same exact thing across all the different social media channels. When I say that, let me put some guardrails. Can you talk about, I'm going to use events again because that's something that's probably relatable to everybody. Can you talk about the event you have upcoming on all your social channels? Yes, you can. But you definitely want to use the strength of each channel, meaning that for some channels, hashtags are really powerful. For others, they're not. For some organizations or some social channels, emojis are more widely accepted than others. You also want to be mindful of the image size that social media, different channels on social media will accept. Not every image is going to work on every social media platform. So you want to make sure that you're tweaking your message slightly to be the most effective. Another example of that is you might want to have somewhat of a long post on Facebook, but because of the speed of Twitter and because of character limitations, you may want to keep it relatively short. So you want to make sure that while you can repurpose content, you want to make sure you have that variation in your voice across the different social media channels. As I said, you need to make sure whatever you end up doing, you are in it to win it. We want to make sure that we are using social media as as uh, as a tool that can be very powerful, but that's we need to be there and uh, accessible to make it the most powerful possible, uh, the most powerful tool possible. So you need to actually devote time to be successful at social media. We suggest at least five minutes a day to just drive awareness, talk about what product you have. Talk about what events you have coming up, whatever it is that you would typically promote. You need to devote about five minutes a day to doing that. You also want to make sure that you're listening to what people are saying on social media, and that's part of that five minutes. Look at your comments. Look at your responses. Look at your shares and perhaps comment on the comments. Perhaps thank people for their shares. Engage with people will not only strengthen the relationship with you, not only strengthen the relationship you have with people, but also uh, increase the likelihood that they'll see future posts and other kinds of marketing that you provide on social media. And lastly, get them to take some kind of action. I cannot tell you how many small businesses and nonprofits I've seen that post things that are not engaging. There's no links. There's no action that people can take. We want to make sure that when applicable, we give people the ability to go do something else. Now, the one thing I do want to talk about social media that's a little bit of a, a dark subject is that the power of email and the power of SMS versus social media is who owns the contact. You don't necessarily own the relationship on social media. It's firstly some of it a passive experience. So people can just follow you and it's it's pretty passive. They don't have to really make a commitment to you. But secondly, they, the social media channels, own the contact. So they can change algorithms. They can change the rules. They can change what will happen to your context, contacts on a whim. When it comes to email, when it comes to SMS contacts, you own those contacts, you own those relationships. And while social media is a fantastic tool and an essential tool and an omni-channel marketing strategy, I want to make sure we're aware the power of email and the power of SMS is that you own the cadence and the relationship. You determine what kind of content they'll see. So let's pivot here to email marketing, talk about how to strengthen those relationships with email marketing. The number one thing that makes email marketing very, very powerful is the fact that people have to give you permission to email them. Now, this is not just a constant contact thing or one of our competitors thing. This is actual federal law. And our federal law is actually uh, a little weaker than in some other countries, meaning 
you have to actually get permission to email people. Now, the good news is there's two kinds of permission, implied permission and express permission. Implied permission is somebody gave you a business card. They dropped a business card in a fish pool. They called you for a quote. They interacted with you, and at some point, you got a person's contact information. That's permissible. That's implied permission. Because they know you in some way in the course of doing business, you can email to them. The other is express permission. Express permission, as the name suggests, is they expressively know they're getting email marketing from you. And this is generally going to be driven by forms on your website, by forms on social media, et cetera. Obviously, express permission is the gold standard. If it's not clear already, the fact that I've already talked about uh, email marketing with tools like Constant Contact or Permission Based, and that there's a legal avenue with this, so without saying the fact that I have it in purple in bold, don't buy lists, don't buy email marketing lists. If we think about it, that's not going to be very effective. One, because these people don't know you. The strength of having permission is that people have risen their hand. They are interested in hearing from you. They know what you do. They know what you offer. They know the good you do in the world as a nonprofit. But if they didn't give you permission, if you're buying a list, these people don't know you, and we're actually throwing away the huge value of email marketing in the first place, and also it's going to impact our reputation because a lot of people will mark us as spam, and now we get fewer emails out. The kind of people that buy lists, the kind of people that trade lists, the kind of people that don't use a permission-based list are spammers. That is literally what spammers do. So you want to make sure that you always ask for permission, and if you use a tool like Constant Contact, it's impossible for you to not have permission. That's how we work. So let's talk about ways to grow your list. So you build a form, you build some sort of intake form, you have something um, physical. Now it's time to get people to join. So the one thing I encourage everybody to do is think about all the places you interact with a lead, a customer, a potential volunteer, volunteers, donors, whatever your audience is, think about all the places you might interact with them. When it comes to digital marketing, a lot of people solely think about growing their list in digital ways, and I get that. They kind of go hand in hand, but many people may actually interact with physical media or with you personally. We think about physical media, a customer, a donor, a stakeholder might see flyers, handouts, table tents, window decals. Uh, 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 it goes on and on and on, the kinds of receipts, the, it goes on and on and on, the kinds of things that they'll interact with. So, Let's, let's start with in-person. Obviously, at your office, at your, if you're brick and mortar, at your location. Make sure you're encouraging people to share their email address. And if you're going to do text marketing, obviously share um, their phone number so that you have permission to text them as well. The other piece of this is not just having signage up, not only having a QR code that people can scan, but make sure you train your frontline staff if you are brick and mortar to ask for email addresses. Now, one big thing about collecting email addresses is don't make it about joining an email list. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Obviously, on the phone, if you're collecting information about a lead or you're talking to a customer, so you can get their contact information there. And at events, if you do events, uh, make sure you're collecting and optimizing that experience so that you're collecting contact information there. I'm often said when I, I'm often asked uh, when it comes to events, well, Matt, the event host will share the list with me. Well, that's okay if you're the sole organization at the event, but many of you do trade shows, expo, expos, things like that, where there's a lot of different vendors, there's a lot of different people um, at the event, meaning the booths and the kind of uh, business that would be there. It's better for you to, to grow your list on your own than just blast out an email to everyone that attended the event because they're now getting emails from every exhibitor at said event. Best strategy is to engage with people at your booth, collect their contact information there. Print materials, I've already mentioned, table tents, window decals, et cetera. Anything people would pick up or see include a QR code so that would that QR code when scanned would drive people to a form. If it's not obvious, Constant Contact has forms you can build to drive traffic and grow your list. You want to share that QR code so that people can scan their phones and take action. And then online, the easy one, websites, social media, uh, your email signature, Gmail, Hotmail, et cetera. If you have an email signature, have a link to that form so people can join your list and leverage tools like landing pages. Landing pages are one-page mini websites that you can customize to help you grow your list. And in fact, I'm going to show you an example of a landing page here. This is a landing page built in constant contact. We can see we're soliciting for email addresses and text phone numbers. You'll notice that we are getting permission for both email and getting permission for text. And in fact, we're actually setting the stage for what kind of frequency people will get in terms of our text. But you can't make it just about joining a list. You need to make sure that when you're asking people to join your list, you're giving something of perceived value. 
So a couple of different examples of that perceived value. This is called a list magnet. So instead of just saying, join our list, offer something of value as a reward for them joining your list. So an example of that would be a, a being part of an insider's club, a loyalty club, a, a referral program, making them feel special. And of course they are because they are joining your list, giving them some advantages to having a, being a part of your loyalty program. That's going to encourage people to join their lists because now you're offering something of value. Another value you can do is a giveaway. Offer something, uh, um, a, a pool of uh, uh, a contest so people can uh, get something every month or something of that nature. You do want to watch out. I'm going to actually back up because giveaways, you do have to be careful because giveaways, some people will just sign up just to be a part of the giveaway. Um, and so they'll you'll see an increase of unsubscribes when they don't win the giveaway. You know, so on, in addition, additionally, people will give you a bunch of garbage email addresses and things of that nature. So be careful with giveaways, and especially you may want to think about making sure you can give away something that you can give away to every subscriber. Knowledge. Knowledge is a powerful lead magnet. It's one of the strongest kinds of lead magnets because you are the expert in what you do, and sharing some of that knowledge is not only going to show the value of them joining your list, but it's going to show the kinds of knowledge that you bring to your product, to your services, to your organization. So an example, that would be an ebook or a guide, a checklist. I see checklists and guides used a lot as lead magnets. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Be willing to bet through your, you and your organization you have enough thoughtful content that you could develop into a checklist or guide and offer that as a lead magnet. For especially nonprofits and B2Bs, webinars and classes are a very powerful way to, again, make people feel special. Make it more than just about joining a list. We're sharing education. And especially for B2Bs and nonprofits, things like case studies. As long as it's relevant to your industry and it's going to be useful to your potential subscribers, you might want to employ a list uh, a case study. So we can see here an example of this intake form, Hearts and Tails Animal Rescue is offering a guide for joining their list. Now they're setting the rules, they're saying that you'll receive other emails from us, but what's in it for the subscriber? To get something useful, right? It's not about joining their list. Uh, I see so many organizations have forms like this out in the world, and it says join our list, join our e our, our e blast club. That's not going to get you as many subscribers as you deserve because by, you know, typically when I do this in person and I ask the audience, how many of you want to get another email? No one raises their hand. No one wants another email. So by making it about something valuable, we're now flipping the script and we're now encouraging people to join our list. Just make sure that when you do solicit for email addresses and or phone numbers for texting, that you include things like a privacy policy and terms of service. Now, if you use constant contact, Constant Contact has all of that built in to our intake form, our lead generation form that you can share on social, that you can share in your blog, that you can share in your signature line, that you can turn into a QR code for those print materials. That's all baked in. Now, once you start doing your email marketing, you want to employ two kinds of email marketing strategy, promotional and non-promotional. Now, in my experience, for people that I first teach, that I first meet, most of them lean on the first model, promotion, 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 promotion. You want to make sure that you have a healthy mix, about 20% promotional emails and about 80% mostly educational emails. That has to do with the buying cycle, the donation cycle. Not everybody has the ability or the need or the want to buy, donate, et cetera, from you right now, the second you hit send on that email. It may take them two months. It may take them six months. It may take them a year. It depends on the kind of business you are and the services you offer and the kind of nonprofit that you have. So we want to make sure we stay top of mind and relevant, right? If we do nothing but promote to somebody that doesn't need us right now, then we're just alienating our audience. We want to make sure that we have a healthy mix of promotional and non-promotional content so that if they're not ready to buy, if they're not ready to donate, well, that's what the non-promotional content's for. But we do want to pepper that occasionally with promotional content so that those that are ready, those that were nearly ready, can take action. We also want to make sure that when we build our email content, it is designed for mobile first. Now, Constant Contact is, of course, mobile responsive. It'll change its shape and design based on the device. But we need to make sure that it's really clear and simple. So we want to keep our email as simple as possible, no more than about three or four images, as few call to actions, meaning the thing that we're asking people to do, like a button, like a link. Make sure we keep that limited. And we need to make sure that we're answering these three questions. What's it, what are you offering? How will it help the reader? And what should they do next? They need to be able to see and understand that as quickly as possible. The average email subscriber only spends about seven seconds with an email before they decide to abandon the email 
or take an action. So you can see in this email example, it's really easy for people to understand what they're supposed to do next, what's in it for them, and what the email is all about. For a nonprofit, what are you trying to accomplish? What should you, uh, why should the reader care? And how can the reader get involved? You can get better email results. And I've talked about this and this education is also on alignable for you. Segmentation is the key for success in email marketing. What is segmentation is basically breaking a big list into smaller lists and sending more targeted emails based on things like demographics, based on things like geographic locations and or based on the behavior that they've taken with your other kinds of marketing. Number one question I get around email marketing is how often should I send? In fact, this question comes up pretty consistently in these alignable uh, uh, sessions that I do. It depends. It depends on your audience. It depends on your product. Uh, a restaurant can send more emails than a car dealership. Why? The buying cycle. We're going to buy food. We're thinking about food three, four times a day. We're only going to buy a car every couple of years. So it depends on your organization. What we do suggest is that you send at least one email a month to make sure you're staying top of mind with your audience. You also want to uh, uh, actually determine your email send history by considering uh, uh, what you've done in the past. So one thing you can do is look at the interactions you've had with the cadence you've uh, used in the past. And are you seeing more or less engagement over time based on the frequency you're sending? You can accelerate your email sending more than once a month if you have something really timely to say, like around an event. But we do need to talk about text marketing. We want to make sure we're using text to its best advantages and sending out timely content. So we want to make sure, one, that we have permission to text people. This is a very personal space receiving text. We want to make sure that they opt in. In fact, if you use the text solution with Constant Contact, there is no way to text people unless they raise their hand, unless they opt in. We want to make sure we're confirming that. Uh, um, that registration, we want to make sure we're confirming that opt-in, and we want to include things like disclaimers, terms of service, and privacy policies uh, when they sign up, and we want to make sure we set expectations. The good news is, is, I'm sounding like a broken record, Constant Contact has this built in for you. You can't not do the right thing. We force you to do the right thing. The reason we do that is we want to make sure that you get the biggest possible results when you're doing SMS marketing, and I'll share a personal story. I, got, I was honored to see Paul McCartney now two years ago, it was back in 2022. Um, and Paul McCartney uses text marketing. So when we're waiting for him to come on, um, there's this sign, text me in the phone number. And so I text him the phone number. I immediately got a response back. Now I know it's not Paul. They're probably using some automation, but it was how cool was it to get this message from Paul? And we can see he's moving people into different channels. So he's talking about follow me on social, adding ourselves to community channels. So even Paul McCartney, the brand name that he is, is leveraging email marketing. We want to make sure that we're sending te text messages. Um, we want to be mindful of the time we send to people. So we don't want to send text messages in the middle of the night. We want to make sure that we are are following uh, some consideration of people when we're texting. No one wants to get a message, even from Paul McCartney at one in the morning. And again, this is something at Constant Contact does a very good job of keeping you in the best practices lane. Whatever you do, through email marketing, through social and through text marketing, you want to make sure you're monitoring the results. Too many organizations do email marketing, do social media marketing, do text marketing, and then just walk away. They hit send, they hit post, they walk away. Make sure you're measuring the results on all the channels that you're uh, using to help your organization grow because there is a story in those metrics. Learning what people like more, you give them more of what they like. Learning what they click on, that, that's telling you what kind of content you need to send to that particular audience in the future. So lastly, we want to talk about how to create an overall great experience. You want to make sure you're using all your channels in concert. So you want to make sure, and I'll actually share an example with you, of Paul, he has different kinds of content based on different things he's doing, social, email, and text. So he's got the big party on social, the more intimate party on email, and then that very intimate party on social media. You want to make sure you're employing the power of each channel to help you grow, to help your organization grow, and being mindful that not everything fits each channel. But let's go ahead. I'm going to move up to slide 44 because one channel that you should definitely be employing in your organization to help you grow is Alignable. Constant Contact has a fantastic community group. I'm going to bring Randy back on, talk a little bit about that, and we're going to start taking your questions. Too.